Welcome to Dr. Stephen Sinatra's webinar on eight steps to lower blood pressure naturally. The goal of today's webinar is to help you lower and manage your blood pressure through simple lifestyle changes, smart food choices, and targeted nutritional supplements so that you can enjoy optimal heart health, well-being, and longevity. You can ask a question at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Ask a Question box that appears in the left-hand side of your screen, and then hit Submit. Dr. Sinatra will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Please note that we will send you all of the material from today's webinar in an email later. If you have a question that isn't answered today, please feel free to connect with Dr. Sinatra on Facebook, Twitter, or his blog at drsinatra.com. And now I am very excited and pleased to introduce our presenter, Dr. Stephen Sinatra. Dr. Sinatra is a well-renowned board-certified cardiologist, certified bioenergetics psychotherapist, and certified nutrition and anti-aging specialist. His holistic methods focus on reducing inflammation and maximizing the heart's ability to produce and use energy. Dr. Sinatra takes an integrative approach to heart health and has helped thousands of patients enjoy long, healthy lives with his advice, guidance, and line of highly targeted nutritional supplements for heart health. Thanks, Aaron. It's so great to be here and welcome everybody. I'm touched that you're listening to this webinar. I hope I can make a difference in your life. You know, blood pressure situations and storing blood pressure and the treatments for blood pressure, whether they're pharmaceutical or whether they're alter or alternative, it doesn't have to be rocket science. I mean, at times we need pharmaceutical support. I've done it in my own practice. At, at other times you can do a healthy diet and other interactions or interventions where you can control your blood pressure and support your blood pressure. So today, I'm really excited about introducing to you my pillars of supporting blood pressure, which are a non-inflammatory diet, exercise, targeted nutritional supports, detoxification, mind-body interactions, and earthing. If you bring those pillars to the table and you follow what I say to you today, I firmly believe in my own heart that you can have control over your own life, help support your blood pressure, and help to achieve optimum health. Folks, welcome to Nuts and Bolts of Blood Pressure or maybe Blood Pressure 101. Look, what is blood pressure? Well, you know, blood pressure is really the work your heart needs to do. Basically, when your heart squeezes blood through those vessels, you know, it goes into the great aorta and all through the perif peripheral vessels, you know, that creates a pressure. And if that pressure outside, in these long, and the vessels in my arms and legs is high, that can cause the heart to grow in size. And doctors call that LVH. Now, LVH means an increase in the muscle of the heart. And that's not a good thing. Now, how is blood pressure measured? Well, we can put a cuff on your arm, you know, feet on the floor, and we measure systolic blood pressure, which again is the contraction of the heart, and the diastolic blood pressure, which means it's the resting blood pressure in between cardiac contractions. Now, what's normal? Well, when I was in medical school, you know, you know, more than 40 years ago, we thought if you had a systolic blood pressure less than 138 and a diastolic blood pressure less than 88, that was okay. That doesn't work today, folks. That has, that has no credibility anymore. What we like to see are numbers less than 120 systolic and diastolic 80. In other words, we feel that numbers in that range are really supportive of heart health. Now, I have a problem looking at the numbers. You know, some physicians will treat diastolic alone. However, however, there's an entity called, you know, systolic hypertension that I have concerns about. So I worry if the numbers are high on the systolic side and of course on the diastolic side as well. Now, when do you need to worry? I mean, let's just focus on these numbers. I don't like systolic numbers 135 or, or above or diastolic numbers 85 and above. I like it lower. I like it lower. Now, why do I like it lower? Well, look, the higher the blood pressure, the more strain it puts on your blood vessels. Let me give you an example. 
Let's look at the heart, for example, because, you know, uh, I'm a clinical cardiologist. If you look at the heart vessels, there's bends on those heart vessels. I mean, I've done, you know, you know, lots of work on the heart, and I've seen lots of pictures of, of vessels looking at the heart. Now, on the bends of, of these blood vessels, if the pressure is higher, it creates a weakening, particularly along those bends of blood vessels. And when you have a weakening at the bend, this can allow toxins to get in, oxidized LDL to get in, insulin to get in, any of, any of these unfriendly, what we call endothelial components. So I get really concerned when the pressure is high because if you're a cigarette smoker or if you have metals in the blood or whatever toxins are in the blood, they're gonna get pushed into those vulnerable areas and that can set the stage for inflammation. And we know that inflammation is the root cause of heart disease. Folks, it's not cholesterol like I talked about in a previous webinar. So what are my takeaways, folks? Well, look, in a nutshell, lower is better. If you have a blood pressure of 110 over 60, I would love it. I mean, that's a great support of blood pressure and that's what we should strive for. So next, this is what I wanna do. I wanna talk about the causes of blood pressure. I want to talk about the risk factors and about conventional treatments and alternative treatments. So what are the causes and risk factors of blood pressure? Well, when I was in medical school more than 40 years ago, the professors used to talk about benign blood pressure, essential blood pressure, and it didn't make any sense. You know, about 10% of blood pressure situations that are unhealthy are actually caused by, you know, an overactive thyroid, you know, a blood, a, a, a blood vessel constriction in the kidney, it can be an overactive adrenal, but 90%, and we've only learned this in the last 10 years, folks, 90% of blood pressure unhealthy situations are caused by what we call an increase in the resistance of blood vessels that has to do with oxidative stress, free radicals, and a term that doctors use, endothelial cell unfriendliness. And what this means is that the lining of, of, of the blood vessels, if they become inflamed, these blood vessels can constrict. Or if we cannot sequester a lot of the free radicals in the body, and if we can't really douse out the fires of inflammation in our blood vessels, the pressure can go up, and we don't want that. So what are some of these risk factors. Well, certainly emotional stress is a big risk factor for causing the numbers to soar. Overweight status will put uh, higher numbers into your body. I mean, certainly toxins in the environment, insecticides, pesticides, heavy metals, cigarette smoking for one. Anytime we have thick blood, if our blood is like red ketchup as opposed to red wine, certainly the heart has to work harder and with inflammation on board, the numbers will tend to go up. And then we have the insulin resistance syndrome, which is really a problem in America today. The insulin resistance syndrome is basically, you know, somebody goes into a doctor's office, they've gained weight, they have a weight gain around the middle. If, if you're a male, you're, your waist may be about, you know, 40 inches. If it's a female, maybe 35 to 36 inches. Uh, you know, with the weight gain, your blood lipids tend to go up, but the blood pressure also goes up. And this is a lifestyle consideration. In other words, instead of taking pharmaceutical drugs for the insulin resistance syndrome, you know, drugs for blood pressure, drugs for weight loss, drugs for, you know, lipid lowering, what you really need to do is lifestyle considerations, such as, you know, restrict carbohydrates in your diet, do a little more exercise, and, and, and certainly um, just re reduce the, um, the weight if you can, because higher weight will tend to increase the numbers. Look, a mere five pounds or 10 pounds of weight lowering will cause the numbers to go down. They will really go down. So what if you can't get the numbers down? When do you ask for pharmaceutical drugs? When do you ask your doctor or see your doctor about taking pharmaceutical drugs? Let me tell you about that real soon. And now let's talk about my special considerations. For example, in African Americans, more aggressive pharmaceutical support may be needed, uh, particularly diuretics, since in this group, pharmaceutical support seems to have a slight advantage. 
I would still use alternatives, but again, pharmaceutical support is you know, well adapted here. Now, in Hispanics, we need more aggressive uh, uh, dietary support. In other words, we need to alter the diets and the, and, and the types of foods that Hispanics are eating because in their particular diet, particularly if they're using a lot of oils and deep frying, et cetera, it could cause inflammation. Now, a third group is women. I have special concerns about women because of uh, not only what's been in the literature uh, and, and what panels have discussed, but basically it's the anatomy of a woman. You know, a woman's heart is smaller than a man's. And, and the blood vessels that surround the heart are smaller. So when a woman develops higher blood pressure numbers, she may have more what we call problems in the what we call a left ventricle, and we call this a problem of compliance, where the left ventricle of the heart has difficulty filling with blood. It's a little bit more stiff. And there might be an anatomical concern here, again, because of the smaller nature of the blood vessels. Now, there was a panel of some of the top cardi cardiovascular experts in the country, and they were looking at the 10 top issues affecting women. And I believe issue number seven was this very thing that we call diastolic dysfunction. And what it means is that when the heart is filling with blood, uh, because the um, left ventricle or the muscle may be a little more stiffer, the heart struggles a little bit with filling with blood and the heart needs more energy. So what can happen in a little bit of older women, and men as well, but it affects women more than men, particularly over the age of 45, is that the diastolic dysfunction can be, become moderate to severe, and some of these people will get shortness of breath. And even though it's been in JAMA, the Archives of Internal Medicine, and other journals, the problem is there's no pharmaceutical drugs that treat diastolic dysfunction. And the authors would con continuously say, this is a problem, particularly in women, but we have no drugs that treat it, so what can we do? Well, there's a Sinatra solution to this. This is where pharmaceutical drugs don't do their job, folks. What you need to do here is you need to increase energy into the filling of blood into the left ventricle, and that requires energy substrates, and that's the Sinatra solution, the awesome foursome. That's metabolic cardiology at its best. And what metabolic cardiology does, it literally supports the energy of ATP, and when you do that, you're supporting heart function. Well, my takeaways here is that diastolic dysfunction is a serious problem affecting large, large segments of the population, particularly women. We need to bring energy support to the heart. We need to give the awesome foursome, and that includes coenzyme Q10, magnesium, ribose, and L-carnitine. So, if you're a woman, and you have a little shortness of breath, and your blood pressure numbers are a little bit rising, and you see your doctor, uh, ask him to do an echocardiogram to make sure that you don't have diastolic dysfunction of the heart. So what are some of the treatments of blood pressure? Well, certainly there's conventional and there's alternative. Let's start with the conventional. Look, folks, if your numbers are high, and let's say, let's use 140 over 90 uh, as an example. You're in that area and you're, you, you go to your physician and your physician, you know, wants to use pharmaceutical intervention. I don't have a problem with that, uh, but you will be using lifestyle interventions at the same time. Now, if your physician chooses to use calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, you know, whatever your physician, he or she wants, I'm fine with that. Now, in the process of doing the workup on blood pressure, if your physician finds that you have kidney impairment, you must take pharmaceutical drugs. That's the greatest advantage of pharmaceutical drugs is in preserving the kidney. So I wear my conventional hat. Now, the problem with pharmaceuticals, they have a light side, but they have a dark side. I mean, you know, beta blockers have their baggage, so do calcium channel blockers, so is ACE inhibitors. But I'm sure with working with your physician, you can find a pharmaceutical drug that suits you. 
Now, what are some of the alternative treatments? Well, there's a whole host of alternative treatments. I mean, I've used amylkinase, magnesium, uh, potassium, coenzyme Q10, I mean, omega-3 essential fatty acids, grapeseed extract, vitamin C. I mean, I've used them all in my treatment of, uh, of, uh, of blood pressure. In other words, I'll use them in supporting blood pressure. Uh, and and uh, lots of times these treatments actually uh, do support blood pressure. And uh, there's great clinical studies. For example, there's a superb clinical study on co coenzyme Q10 supporting blood pressure and, and actually driving numbers in the right direction. So um, alternative situations can be utilized. Again, we would use targeted nutritional supplements with weight loss, with you know, lifestyle changes, stress reduction. You know, all these interventions that calm the um, autonomic nervous system. Uh, you know, we're even doing a study on grounding, for example, and, and, and blood pressure support. So there's lots of situations you can bring to the table that really support blood pressure. So what are my takeaways here? I know this is a, this is a complex situation, but I'm gonna give you three easy, easy things. Reduce weight. Consult your doctor if your numbers are approaching 138 over 88 or more. If you're a smoker, please stop because smoking causes constriction of blood vessels. There's also that nicotine effect. Reduce carbs and support insulin because if you have insulin surges and um, you're eating a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of sugars, this is going to cause inflammation and endothelial cell unfriendliness of the blood vessels, which can cause numbers to soar. So those are my three takeaways. So let's talk about my eight-step program to support blood pressure naturally. Well, at the top of the list, folks, there's the Mediterranean Pan-Asian diet. I've written about these diets for years in my books. What's so special about these diets? Well, first of all, they bring non-inflammatory foods to the table, such as, I can say, garlic and onions, olive oil, natto, sardines. I mean, the list goes on and on. But these foods are key because, first of all, if we look at sardines, I'm just gonna give you an example. Sardines that have peptides that promote blood pressure support. So does wakimi seaweed. And there was a phenomenal study, the Prenamed study that came out of Spain, only recently reported in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that olive oil, olive oil not only supports the uh, insulin resistance syndrome, people lose weight and blood pressure support is realized as well. It's absolutely phenomenal. In fact, I am so bullish on olive oil, and some of the recent data shows that it downgrades inflammatory genes, in addition to being one of the most endothelial-friendly components you can take into the diet. So olive oil is key. Now, these foods collectively um, actually reduce inflammation. The other thing is you wanna eat more fats, healthy fats. Healthy fats, certainly bring a lot to the table because you don't get an insulin response, particularly if you're eating avocado uh, or olive oil, which have monounsaturated fats. These fats do not put a, 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 an energy drain on your pancreas. Now, omega-3 fats, both cultures eat a lot of fish. Uh, you know, fish contain omega-3s. Certainly squid contains omega-3s. You know, if you're a vegetarian, you can get it from chia seed, flax seed, even tofu. But omega-3s actually promote blood pressure uh, support as well. So these foods are key, and uh, uh, they, they need to be incorporated into the diet. Now, what about salt and sodium? Well, there's a lot of controversy about this. Uh, you know, the sodium that's in processed foods or in fast foods, for example, a flame broiled chicken at a fast food restaurant, you can get like 1,300 milligrams of sodium. If you have a dill pickle, throw in another, another thousand. If you have French fries, throw in another seven or 800 milligrams. Now you're up to over three, three and a half grams a day. That's a little bit too much sodium if you're dealing with, you know, blood pressure issues. However, the converse of a very low sodium diet, less than 1.8 grams, also can be a disaster. So sodium has a sweet point. You don't want too much and you don't want too little because if you have too little, you can get hormonal 
relationships in the kidney that can cause blood pressure to really go even higher. So talk to your doctor, but I would say, and, and, and what I recommend is I like a diet of not, not the uh, sodium preservatives, but if you want to pinch a little sea salt or Himalayan salt on your food, I'm fine with that. Just avoid the foods, the processed foods like canned soups, uh, you know, particularly dry soups, and you know all these different uh, foods that have a lot of sodium. Read labels. In other words, you want to have a label that shows more potassium, which supports blood pressure, as opposed to sodium, which can raise blood pressure, particularly if you go over you know three and a half to four grams. Now. Another consideration are juices. People think fruit juices are healthy. They're really not. They contain a lot of sugar, unless if you make your own juices. You know, if you juice, you know, with fresh fruits and vegetables, I have no problem with that. But if you're buying these conventional, you know, sugary juices, uh, they're out. Sodas are out because too much sugar can drive hormonal relationships into the direction of inflammation, and then uh, that can cause you know, uh, constriction and infl inflammation of the body, oxidative stress, and we don't want that you know, in a blood pressure situation. Um, alcohol, I'm a little more neutral here, you know, maybe neutral, positive. Remember, if you want a glass of wine, in the, in the uh, Mediterranean diet studies, in the pre-med studies, they had one glass of wine a day. I have no problem with that. Just remember, when it comes to alcohol, less is more. So what are my takeaways on diet? A non-inflammatory diet, folks. That is so key. Lessen carbohydrate intake. Cut out sugars. Very, very crucial. Eat f particular foods that support blood pressure and avoid the sugars. So let's talk about movement and exercise. You know, a lot of you folks out there, you know, may think that that's a bad word, but it's not. Look, I'm not talking about pumping iron. I'm not talking about going to the gym. I'm not talking about jogging. I'm talking about just bringing some movement into your life. Let's face it, go walking. Take some dancing lessons. Go for a swim. Any of those aerobic activities support blood pressure. And the, the way it does it, especially if you do it for longer periods of time, is that in the resting phases, after forms of, let's say, suppose you, you walked for a half hour or an hour, or suppose you went swimming, you know, in a pond for a half hour or 15 minutes or so, or suppose you were dancing. And uh, at the end of a night of dancing, ballroom dancing, any form of dancing, and you're resting, and if you have a little sweat going on, what happens is you get vasodilation and numbers get lower. And this supports blood pressure. That's the physiology behind exercise and blood pressure support. So when it comes to lowering numbers, when it comes to blood pressure support, if you're sedentary, it's going to be harder. So my takeaway in this segment, exercise, move your body, get out there and have some fun. Let's talk about targeted nutritional supports. First of all, there is nothing better than a non-inflammatory diet and an endorsed diet and it's crucial. However, even the best diets are gonna be lacking in targeted nutritional supports. Let me give you an example. Look at the Pan-Asian diet, especially if you're a vegetarian. If you're a pure vegetarian, you're gonna get lots of minerals, you're gonna get lots of fiber, this is all great, but you're not gonna get coenzyme Q10 in a pure vegan vegetarian diet. It's just not gonna happen, so you need to supplement. Now, why take targeted nutritional supplements? Well, first of all, when we talk about blood pressure, we need to bring oxidative stress to the table. We know that free radicals, oxidative stress, and inflammation are sort of the sine qua non for blood pressure situations. So how do we reduce oxidative stress? How do we reduce free radicals? Well, diet's a good place to start, but it's not gonna give us everything. This is what I like for blood pressure support. I like coenzyme Q10. There's great studies to show that coenzyme Q10, because it reduces oxidative stress and free radicals, it supports blood pressure. Vitamin C. Vitamin C, like grapeseed extract, can support nitric oxide. And when that occurs, 
basically you get a little more vasodilation and blood pressure support is realized. Magnesium. Magnesium is one of the most important minerals for blood pressure support because it has this endothelial cell friendly situation in the lining of the blood vessels. It supports the lining and it reduces the impact of vasoconstriction. So I love magnesium. Now potassium is taken in some supplements. Uh, I've seen supplements where they're given 100 milligrams up to 500 milligrams. We need potassium. Potassium is the most supportive mineral for the heart. Potassium is crucial. The problem today is that most of our foods are fortified with sodium and you need more potassium in a diet. Unfortunately, a lot of us don't get it in a diet, so I like to supplement with at least, you know, 100 to 500 milligrams. You know, a small banana is basically about 600 milligrams. Now, resveratrol is important because studies have shown some vasodilation, we call it forward medial dilatation when they do studies in the brachial artery. And resveratrol, again, it has this nice endothelial friendly component where it supports blood pressure. I also like hawthorn berry. Hawthorn berry, like garlic, and garlic can also be taken as a supplement, actually has what we call an ACE inhibiting effect. In other words, they work on hormonal interactions in the lung and basically they can support blood pressure as well. So, even if you eat the best non-inflammatory diet, you must, and I want to emphasize, you must bring some targeted nutraceuticals to the table. What are my takeaways? Well, certainly, eat a non-inflammatory diet, take some coenzyme Q10, vitamin C, magnesium, potassium, consider resveratrol, strongly consider um, grapeseed, and strongly consider Hawthorne Berry. Why is detoxification of blood pressure support? Well, it's kind of simple, folks. When we have toxins in the body, whether it's insecticides, pesticides, chemicals, um, mercury, heavy metals, I mean, the list goes on and on. This causes oxidative stress. And we know that oxidative stress and free radicals can cause vasoconstriction of blood vessels, and this can cause blood pressure numbers to rise. So it makes sense to use a detoxification program. Now, what can you do in your everyday life? Well, certainly, high fiber diets are great. You know, the average American takes in 11 to 14 grams of fiber. We need to take in 40 to 50 grams a day as a minimum. What does fiber do? Well, it washes out toxins out of the GI tract. It facilitates bowel movements. And if you add psyllium to, let's say, a high fiber drink, and I have lots of videos on high fiber drinks where you can use fruits and vegetables, and if you add psyllium or chia seed or crushed up flax seed, wow, you get an, an enormous amount of fiber. And that's great because that's gonna take all that stuff that's in our GI tract that can cause silent inflammation in the body. This is where exercise helps as well. When we exercise, we're moving. When, 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 when we're walking, when we're swimming, when we're dancing, when we're bringing movement to the table, we're increasing the energy of the lower GI tract. When that occurs, we're facilitating energy and that helps to alleviate obstipation and constipation. Now, what else do I like for detoxification? I love sweating. Sweating is crucial. Some of us will sweat with exercise. When I was a college wrestler, I used to sweat like crazy. I didn't know it back then, but I must have been doing my body tremendous support for detoxification. Why? Because when you sweat, when you sweat, you're taking out the toxic chemicals, the insecticides, the pesticides, the phthalates. I mean, the list goes on and on. You're taking it out of the subcutaneous layer of the fat that lays below our skin when the pores open up. So if you do high intensity exercise, sweating is great. If you don't wanna exercise, think about a sauna. Saunas can do this too. The infrared waves from a sauna can penetrate our skin, heat up our body, open up our, our pores in our skin, and flush out chemicals, especially mercury. It's one of the best ways of detoxifying mercury. Hot yoga. Another great form of stretching, poses, a little bit of heavy breathing, exercises. These also will help to facilitate uh, toxins from the skin. So what are my takeaways on detoxification? Its role in blood pressure is crucial. 
We need to detoxify the body. Think about high fiber, think about sweating, and of course, think about sauna as well. I bet you never heard about earthing or grounding. Well, it's part of my pillars in supporting blood pressure. What is earthing or grounding? Well, when you walk barefoot on the earth, what you're doing is you're taking electrons into the body. And how is that so? Well, the earth is struck by lightning, literally a, you know, a couple of thousand times a minute, particularly around the equator, in the tropical areas. And these lightning strikes feed the earth with electrons. And when we walk barefoot, we take in the electrons through acupuncture points in our feet. They deliver it into the body, and what they do is they help to neutralize what we call oxidative stress. And we know that oxidative stress is a component of blood pressure. So in other words, the more oxidative stress we have, the more inflammation we have, the more blood pre pressure we have. So it makes sense to help neutralize blood pressure with grounding techniques. So how can you earth? Well, certainly barefoot is one. Sand, the beach, grass, tile, concrete, not asphalt. I don't like asphalt because there's chemicals inside and it'll disconnect you from the earth. Barefoot is key. You can walk on leather. I don't like neoprene. It disconnects us from the earth. Those are sneakers. You know, those are out for me. The other way you can earth is you can sleep grounded. There are sheets you can purchase. Basically, they have sheets. They have, they have uh, silver threads in it. They're connected to a, either a wire you plug into your uh, ground socket of your home, particularly if your home was built after 1965 with good grounding, or you can put a stake in the ground. Actually, we're doing a clinical study on blood pressure support and earthing. We're, we're trying to do it out of uh, California as well as in the Midwest, a multi-centered study. So when it comes to blood pressure support, I love earthing. What are my takeaways here? Ground as much as you can. Walk barefoot in the park, and if you want to sleep grounded, I encourage that as well. Now let's talk about emotional stress. How are emotional stress and blood pressure situations connected? I mean, it's obvious. When we're under emotional stress, what happens is we have a discharge of hormones in our body. We can call it adrenaline, epinephrine, noradrenaline, cortisol, but all these hormones interact because of emotions, and we can literally overdose on our hormones. I mean, let's face it, I mean, cardiovascular situations can occur during emotional stress, and certainly blood pressure is one of those situations that can be adversely affected. So when it comes to blood pressure support, we must, we must do interventions to reduce emotional stress because emotional stress in combination with the hormonal surges will cause oxidative stress and that'll cause our total peripheral resistance in the body to rise and then we got blood pressure problems. So what do you do? Well, there's lots of techniques for, you know, emotional release, but some easy ones, I like the Jacobson technique. You know, you can lay down on your back or sit in a chair, you can tighten your feet, you can tighten your shoulders, you can tighten your arms, push your lower back into the chair. In other words, you can take isolated muscle groups where you tighten them up and then relax. Tighten, relax. You can do it on the face, for example. I can tighten up my face like this and then breathe and then relax. And when you do this and you do various muscle groups, and there's books on this, you can Google this. I mean, it's very easy to do. You can actually cause relaxation in the body. Now, another intervention I like is meditation. Meditation, whether you use a mantra or just meditating on the word Om, like something like that, and you are sitting still for 20, 25 minutes, that's great. That also discharges hormones in the body, forces us to rest and clear our mind. Remember, it's the chatter in your mind you wanna get rid of. So when you meditate, uh, again, if you have a mantra or if you wanna medita meditate on the word Om and contemplate what that means in the meditation, you could do that. And I highly endorse it because we all need quieting in our lives. Pets bring something to the table as well. I love dogs. In fact, I had three dogs in my last 20 years, and I was blessed because I lived from 14 to 16 each dog, and, and I put them on CoQ10, and 
and they really created a lot of joy in my life. And here's the joy, folks. When you're petting a pet, and that pet's looking at you with love in their eyes, and uh, they're wagging their tail, or if you're hand feeding a pet, and they're taking food from you and they're wagging their tail, they're connected. I mean, have you, have you ever seen a dog? They bark with their head and their tail. They're integrated. And what a pet does for us is if we take in that love, if we take in that integration, if we do that, we are supporting our blood pressure. Positive emotions like love support blood pressure. So I'm bullish on pets. Let me talk about yoga. Yoga is phenomenal. Phenomenal. When you do yoga poses, particularly the twist, or, or if you're doing uh, relaxation poses, or poses where it's a little bit uncomfortable and you have to breathe into the pose. When you breathe into the pose, what you're doing is you're stimulating the parasympathetic limb of the nervous system and you're balancing, again, the autonomic and the parasympathetic. Remember, we have a overbalance. In other words, we have our sympathetic nervous system is out of balance. Uh, we, we call it heightened sympathetic tone. Even simple air pollution does that. Emotional stress does that. There's so many things that get us out of balance. But when you do yoga and you breathe, and whenever you're breathing, and there's lots of exercises in yoga where we do focus on breathing, it stimulates that parasympathetic limb and it supports heart rate variability, which, which is one of the best things you can do for your heart. So what are my takeaways here? Connect with a pet. If you want to, I think it's great. Do some yoga, do some meditation, do these exercises that take us out of our mind and really relax the mind and the body. I love it and I hope you do it too. So what about managing our emotions? Emotional toxicity or not being able to unravel emotional blocks is a serious problem. In other words, if you are stewing in your emotions, or if you have held in anger or resentment, these emotions are the Achilles heel of the cardiovascular system. They can adversely affect blood pressure. You know, it's like driving our car with our brakes on. We don't want to do that. And that's what held in anger and resentment or rage do to us. And it is a very serious problem. So what do you need to do? Well, first of all, you need to have, if you are an angry person, you know, see a therapist. Work on it. Um, you know, try to work through your anger. Experience your anger in therapy. Don't kick the cat or take it out on your spouse, but really work on your anger. And there are specialists that work on this. I did it for years as a psychotherapist. Now, sadness, however, is a very good emotion. When you're sad, and if your sadness leads to tears and crying, this is one of the, we're sobbing, where you're shaking your whole body when you're crying, this is a release, and this really helps with blood pressure. This is an emotion that supports blood pressure. I'll never forget a workshop I did when I was chief of cardiology at a hospital I worked at in Connecticut. We took 44 participants, and we measured their urines in a stress and illness seminar. We had a control group, and we had a, an intervention group, and we looked at men and women. And in the workshop, uh, over 48 hours, people had a you know, collect their urine, and we measured the breakdown products of stress hormones, the, the breakdown products in the urine. So we brought some science to the table. And what we showed was this. It was truly remarkable. The women in the workshop who had a lot of anger out, a lot of tears, a lot of feeling, uh, these women would network with one another. They would hug one another. They would cry with one another. They would share with one another. And when we broke the codes, um, they had very little stress hormones in their urine, and none of the women had cardiovascular problems. I mean, I was, it was pretty amazing. But when it came to the men who were like lumps of clay, they were, they were like this, they were stuck, they wouldn't cry, they wouldn't share, they just, you know, held together, they didn't show emotion. When we broke the codes on their urines, they had astronomical levels of stress breakdown products in their urine. When I wrote that paper up and I thought about it, I realized for the first time in my life that men who don't cry can be susceptible to heart problems. That really affected me. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I spent uh, 10 years in a uh, psychotherapy program trying to teach people how to deal with emotions. 
Now, the third aspect of blood pressure support is you must, you must tell the truth. And I learned this through experiments and publications I did on earthing. When you tell a lie, what happens is that the skin conductance immediately, uh, there's a blip. It's like a lie detector test. And what I realized is this, and this is my observation. This has not been written up in the literature. Uh, my colleagues may not even agree with me. I mean, this is my observation as a heart specialist for over 40 years, and particularly when I've been working with experiments with earthing over the last 10 years. But my feeling is this, that when you don't tell the truth, your autonomic nervous system knows the truth. So when a lie detector test, and 99% of people can't, you know, beat it, I mean, you know, it's, it's an established fact that when you tell a lie or have a misrepresentation, I believe it's a betrayal of the self. And when that happens, because your true self knows the truth, and when that happens, then you get a surge of, of biochemical interactions in the body because there's a disconnect here. A part of your nervous system knows the truth, and your brain is coming out with something else. And whenever we have disconnection, we don't have harmony in the body. So, again, it's my only, it's my observation, but tell the truth. So what are my takeaways here? Very simple. Emotions can affect blood pressure. There's no doubt about it. Unravel your emotional toxicity. Get in touch with us. It's okay to cry and tell the truth. So how do you put this all together? You got to maintain a healthy lifestyle. That's it. You know, folks, my health is my hobby. I walk my talk. Whatever I told you in this webinar is what I do. I do it. And I'll tell you another story. I visited another physician a couple of weeks ago. I'm shooting a documentary on health. And uh, I ate at his house and uh, I actually slept there and he cooked me dinner. And his name is Dr. Joe Mercola. And Joe walks his talk because he fed me sprouts and some fermented kimchi, cabbage. He gave me some pasteurized butter, he even cooked up a little organic raised beef chopped up to put over the salad. And it was awesome. I mean, everything I ate was high vibrational food. No insecticides, no chemicals, you know, you know nothing that's gonna hurt me or adversely affect my blood pressure. Dr. Mercola and myself, we walk our talk. You know, we practice what we preach. And that's what I want you to do. In other words, supporting blood pressure is really supporting your lifestyle. And you need to believe in your own heart that you can do this. If you have positive intention, if you believe that Taking my six pillars is the way to go. I truly believe that you are powerful enough and that you can empower yourself so much that you can help to overcome blood pressure problems. So what are my takeaways here? Very simple, a non-inflammatory diet, do some daily walking or some other forms of exercise, incorporate detoxification into your, or detoxification maneuvers into your body to lessen the toxic burden. Do mind-body techniques, and I'm particularly fond of yoga because of the breathing associated with it, which balances the autonomic nervous system. Take targeted nutritional supports, particularly my awesome foursome, magnesium and CoQ10 at the top of the list, and I like others as well. And then last but not least, put earthing into your life. Get back to nature. Get back to Mother Earth. You bring in these six pillars, you're going to support your blood pressure. That wraps up my presentation, Aaron. And now comes my favorite part, answering your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinatra, for that great presentation. Everyone, we're now going into the Q&A session. Be sure to use the promo code offer that's now on your screen. And let's jump right to your questions. The first one asks, what can happen if a blood pressure concern goes untreated? If you had a blood pressure concern for several months and it's consistently elevated, absolutely, you should be concerned. Look, blood pressure situations, 
If they go unnoticed is one thing, but if you know your blood pressure is a problem and it's consistent, you must get in touch with your doctor. This is a very important concept here. In other words, we want to be preventive here. In other words, we want to prevent events. And in order to do that, you must take responsibility. Please go see your doctor. All right. And our next question asks, what is a normal blood pressure range? The normal blood pressure range is really confusing. It's confusing for doctors as well. Years ago, we thought 140 over 90 was acceptable. Then we thought 120 over 80 was acceptable. Now we're going even lower. We're thinking 110, 115 over 60 to 70 is the best blood pressure. So when it comes to blood pressure, I like lower. Lower is better. All right. Well, thank you for that answer, Dr. Sinatra. And moving on to our next question here, it asks, could my blood pressure be elevated at the doctor's office? Oh, when you go to a doctor's office or a dentist's office and your blood pressure is taken, of course it could be elevated. I mean, we call that white coat hypertension. That's an entity that is clearly defined in the literature. And what it means is that when you're under vigilance or stress, or if you're worried about the pump on your arm going up and up. For some people, it's uncomfortable. Others worry about what the numbers are going to be. That's the power of emotional stress. Emotional stress can affect the numbers. And what we really need to be aware of is that if it's in certain situations, and remember this, whenever you get your blood pressure taken, you must breathe. If you're holding your breath during your blood pressure uh, measurements, this can cause the numbers to go up. So under a uh, office situation, a doctor's office, if you're not breathing, these can cause situations to make your blood pressure rise. And afterwards, when you're more relaxed, the blood pressure comes down. That is the entity we call white coat hypertension. And how often should I see my doctor if I'm taking blood pressure medications? Well, that's a good question. I mean, if you have a blood pressure problem and you're on medication, some doctors like to see their patients every three months, every six months, even maybe a year. It depends on how stable you are in those medications. In other words, if a doctor chooses maybe one pharmaceutical intervention and maybe a few supplements or a combination, and your pressure is running in the, let's say, 120s over 70s, and he feels satisfied, he may say, I'll see you in six months to a year especially if he, if he has chronicity of office visits, which show that you have good blood pressures on subsequent visits. So it depends on the case. It's always a good idea to check in with your doctor. Some doctors are more aggressive than others, uh, but just remember this, if you're on blood pressure medication and if your blood pressure is stable, it'd be less visits. However, sometimes it can go up and down, it can be more unstable, and then you need more frequent visitations with your physician. And are ACE inhibitors safe? Well, your question is a good one in that you're on an ACE inhibitor. Are they safe? Yes, they're safe. I mean, ACE inhibitors are probably one of my more favorite blood pressure um, lowering drugs. Um, and the reason why is that the newer generation of ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, have very few side effects. Uh, and in addition, they act like antioxidants as well. So they bring an additional element you know, to the table, so to speak. So I do like ACE inhibitors. Uh, I also like other medications. ACE inhibitors, to me, is a good frontline therapy. If you had a previous heart attack and a scar in your heart, and you also have high blood pressure at the same time, uh, doctors may choose beta blockers, but they have their baggage of side effects. But beta blockers are very good at suppressing ectopic beats in the heart. And then there's diuretics, but then they bring their baggage because they can waste potassium and magnesium. So whatever your doctor is comfortable with, that's a good thing, especially when a doctor and a patient can agree on a, on a blood pressure lowering drug. I do like ACE inhibitors and particularly the ARBs, so it sounds like you're in good shape. My blood pressure is in the normal range, but my parents both had high blood pressure. Does that mean I will have high blood pressure too? Well, now you're saying I've been dealt a 
bad set of genes. Remember, the environment rules here. The environment is king. If you have normal blood pressure, but yet your parents had high blood pressure, as long as you follow a healthy lifestyle, don't smoke, keep your weight down, eat a non-inflammatory diet, do some mind-body interactions, grounding, maybe nutritional support as well, I'm not going to worry about you, particularly since you said your numbers are satisfactory. Remember this, genetics play a role, but not the major role. The environment can select out, a toxic environment can select out weak genetics. So in your case, I don't have any concerns at this point. All right. Well, we have time for one more question here. And this one will be it. So Dr. Sinatra, if you would explain a little more how menopause affects blood pressure in women. Well, when women enter menopause, things happen in their body. And, um, you know, some women uh, have more emotional distress because uh, they may have insomnia. They may be more irritable. Um, they, they may be getting headache because of falling estrogen levels. And this in itself can raise blood pressure. Also, women, when they go into menopause, they may gain weight. And I really believe, I said it before and I'll say it again, if a woman gains 5, 10, or 20 pounds in the menopause state, Will her numbers rise? Many times the numbers will rise. So menopause throws a monkey wrench into the um, situation of blood pressure, especially if they're gaining weight and they have emotional issues at the same time. So I get concerned when blood pressure goes up during the early menopause uh, uh, ages or in a perimenopause state or even in full-blown menopause. All right, that wraps up our webinar today. Some final notes. Everyone, please be sure to go to the Facebook after party from 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, where Dr. Sinatra will continue to answer questions that attendees have. Also, please be sure to take our exit survey right after this event. And do know you will receive a recording of this via email tomorrow. So that's it. Thank you, Dr. Sinatra. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And with that, we are done. And Aaron, thank you. You know, I've had so much fun doing this, and I hope I participated in some people's lives. I hope I can make a difference in your life. I know for me, I felt empowered knowing that I might help you. So thanks so much, and hopefully I'll see you next time.